Hello, and welcome to Texas Holocaust Remembrance Week 2021. My name is Nami Echelov, and I'm the Holocaust Memorial Museum of San Antonio's director, as well as the interim CEO for the Jewish Federation of San Antonio. We want to thank you for joining us for this special program, as well as to thank the Texas Holocaust and Genocide Commission for underwriting all the production costs associated. In case you'd like to see any of our other programs or other resources available put forth by the museum, please make sure to check out the Holocaust Memorial Museum's website at hmmsa.org. And now for our program. Thank you. My name is Julie Zucker, and I'm the Director of Jewish Engagement and Learning at the Jewish Federation of San Antonio. Thank you for joining us for this important week of Holocaust education. Before I introduce our presenter, Mrs. Ursula Kaplan, who is going to speak about her experience as a child during the November pogrom, also known as Kristallnacht, I'm going to give you some background information on pogroms. A pogrom refers to a violent attack primarily against those of the Jewish faith by the non-Jewish population. These pogroms were not unique to the Nazis. In fact, pogroms had been around for centuries, but were only labeled as such in the early 1800s. In Eastern Europe, Jews were commonly targeted for anti-Semitic attacks, which made living in these areas extremely difficult. Many Jews immigrated to other countries to avoid these pogroms. These pogroms continued in Eastern Europe even after the end of World War I. Turning to Germany and the rise of the Nazi party in the interwar years, which are the years from the end of World War I in 1918 to the start of World War II in 1939, saw life for the Jewish population throughout Germany and Eastern Europe become increasingly difficult. Now, this was not a change that happened overnight. When the Great Depression hit in 1929, causing millions throughout the world to become unemployed, Germany was particularly affected as they were still dealing with the reparation payments placed on them from the Treaty of Versailles. As unemployment rose in Germany, so too did Hitler's popularity. More and more people were drawn to his fiery speeches of rebuilding Germany into the great nation it once was prior to signing this treaty, which was seen as a national humiliation. Most Germans may not have agreed with him on all speaking points, but most could find one or more elements in Nazism attractive. The national German election in 1930 saw the Nazi party rise to the second largest in the state. The 1932 election saw the party become the largest in the state, and Hitler was eventually appointed as Chancellor of Germany by German President Paul von Hindenburg. After a failed attempt, to outcast German Jews from society in 1933 with a boycott of Jewish-owned stores, Hitler and the Nazi party realized that this was a process that had to be done over time. With the introduction of anti-Jewish policies in the mid-1930s, such as the Nuremberg Laws, German Jews were slowly outcasted from society. In October of 1938, the Nazis passed a law that invalidated passports of German Jews. In order to get a valid passport, Jews had to surrender their old ones and receive a new passport that was stamped with a red letter J to indicate that they were Jewish. <laughs> you can see that here on the passport of Mrs. Kaplan's father. In order to push the boundary even further, the Nazis needed an excuse. This came in the form of the assassination of a German official in Paris by a Jewish teenager, Herschel Greenspoon, who learned that his parents, who were Polish Jews, had been expelled from Germany. His parents, along with thousands of others, were stuck at a refugee camp after being denied entry into Poland. 
This killing allowed the Nazis to incite violence against the Jews. The November pogrom, organized by the Nazis, spread throughout Austria, Germany, and the Sudetenland, starting on November 9, 1938. This pogrom caused massive damage to the Jewish communities. Homes, schools, hospitals, and businesses were looted and destroyed. Jewish cemeteries were vandalized, and thousands of synagogues were desecrated and burned down. All the while, the police and firefighters were told only to protect German property, but to allow the rest to burn. The November pogrom resulted in millions of damages, and around 30,000 Jewish men were arrested and sent to concentration camps. Jews were unable to collect their insurance claims for the damages to their businesses and homes, as the Nazi government confiscated these funds. To make the situation worse, the responsibility for the pogrom and eventual cleanup fell to the Jewish community. After the aftermath of the November pogrom, many Jews tried to flee Germany. However, the Nazi government forced Jews fleeing from the regime to relinquish most of their assets and limited the amount of money they were allowed to take out of the state. For the Jews who were able to get out, they had little money to help establish themselves in a new country. Many countries required an immigrant to have multiple sponsors to assure that they would not become a burden on the state. With the refugee problem growing, U.S. President Roosevelt convened a meeting known as the Evian Conference with 32 countries to discuss placement for the fleeing Jewish populations of Germany and German-occupied territories. While many countries were sympathetic, the excuses as to why they could not allow in more refugees was a common theme at the convention. Only one country, the Dominican Republic, raised its immigration quota. This conference was designed to protect America's image rather than to help the Jews. The Kinder Transport was one of a few humanitarian gestures that would save thousands of Jews during the pre-war years. Great Britain allowed 10,000 Jewish children to stay in the state. Granted, they had a private citizen or organization to tend for their needs. A similar effort was put forth in the American Congress, not once, but twice. However, both times, Congress did not allow it. Now that you know the history of this pogrom, I'd like to introduce Mrs. Ursula Kaplan, who is going to tell you her first testimony of what she experienced as a child during the November pogrom. This is the story of Kristallnacht the night of broken glass, and how it affected my life. It is November 9th, 1938, in Nuremberg, Germany. I had just celebrated my sixth birthday last month. Don't get your calculators out. I'm 88 years young. <laughs> my baby brother celebrated his six-month birthday on my birthday. We were exactly five and a half years apart and we would forever celebrate our birthdays together and our half birthdays. I lived in a rather large house with a beautiful backyard full of fruit trees and other vegetation. I would watch the zeppelins, like the Goodyear blimps, flying over from my sandbox. We had a live-in gardener. I had a nanny and my mother had a cook and various other domestic help. You might say I lived a privileged life. My father manufactured jokes, tricks, and magic, and would bring back the most magical, to magical toys after attending biannual toy fairs. My most favorite and treasured doll, Ilsebil, went everywhere with me. Her clothes were tailor-made to duplicate mine. She came with us to the United States, and I still have her today. And here she is, a little worse for wear, but still with me. 
I renamed her Elizabeth to Americanize her. I traveled to Italy every six weeks to visit my grandparents who lived in Milan. I have many pictures of me feeding the pigeons with my grandfather. I loved spending time in their kitchen with their cook. I was told that I spoke a pretty good Italian. Sadly, I don't remember any of it. We traveled to Switzerland often where I rode the gondola up the mountain and there are pictures of me on huge skis with ski poles twice as big as I am on the snow-capped mountain. We had lots of picnics with family and friends in the Schwarzwald, the Black Forest, to pick berries and mushrooms, a popular pastime of the day, a pretty idyllic childhood. But now it is the night of November 9th, 1938. I was asleep. My mother awakens me. It is still dark out. My mother is tossing clothes into a trunk in the hall outside of my room. The clothes I am to wear hang over the door. She says, get dressed, we're going on a trip. As I've said, I was used to traveling, but this felt different. Where are we going, I asked. A surprise, she answered. The four of us, my mother, my father, my brother tucked into a baby basket and I was standing at the garage door when someone banged on the door and shouted out, open up now. There they were, five or six, I'm not sure anymore how many, men in black uniforms with red swastikas armbands. They looked very angry and they pushed us back and moved us into a bedroom. There followed a banging and crashing and glass breaking. We were terrified. We were crouched against a wall. And then the telephone started ringing and ringing. And then there was silence. I don't know how long we stayed in that room, but eventually we ventured out. The destruction was devastating. Furniture broken art pieces smashed all over the floor. I was told many years later that my reaction was, wait till the maid sees this, what a mess. The sweet naivety of a child. But somehow it did leave a deep impression as I can recall it to this day. I was also told many years later that the phone ringing was my grandmother calling to warn us that Germans were breaking into their ho into homes and get out because we were Jewish. My parents had been told by a friend whose husband had been taken to the concentration camps to get out quickly. This is why we were trying to make a run for it. By some miracle, they did not take my father. How lucky I was. So many men were carted off to concentration camps that night. As this, was become, this would become known as Crystal Night. Crystal Nacht, the night of broken glass. Things were never quite the same after that night. We had to wear armbands signifying that we were Jewish. There were soldiers in and out of the house for weeks. Everything was being packed or taken out. My father and I made one more trip to Italy. My mother and brother stayed behind. I was told that I said something to the border security police that almost got us arrested. Another proof of childhood innocence. Fast forward. It is now March 1939. We are getting ready to board a plane to London where we had many English relatives and we were planning to spend several weeks there before emigrating to the United States. Before boarding the plane, at the airport a uniformed, very large, mean-looking woman pulls me aside and says, Bussen halde runter, take off your bra. 
This startled six-year-old had to take off her top to prove that she wasn't hiding anything, much less even wearing a bra. Another childhood memory etched in my brain. These were the days before jet planes, so I was violently ill on the short trip from Nuremberg to London. Once there, I was deposited at my great uncle Max's home. My parents and brothers stayed in a hotel. My, my uncle had two daughters, one close to my age, my cousin Liz, once removed as she refers to herself, who now lives in Canada and we still stay in close touch. They lived in a beautiful home replete with butlers and nannies, but I spoke no English, so I was miserable. We were to stay a month, but my father sensed that things were getting too dangerous. He already had booked a passage on a ship. He changed our booking to an earlier one. The ship we were to go on originally was sunk by a German sub. Another miracle for my family. My brother celebrated his first, first birthday on the ship and we arrived in New York Harbor on Easter Sunday, 1939. To this day, I still get an enormous feeling of pride when I see the Statue of Liberty. We moved to an apartment in Sunnyside, Queens, which my aunt and uncle had rented for us. They preceded us to the States by a year. I was put in first grade and quickly mastered the English language. I became an American citizen. I finished high school, college, taught school, got married, had children, grandchildren, moved to Texas from New York. I was living the American dream. I am still filled with pride when I salute the flag and sing the Star Spangled Banner. God bless America and America the beautiful bring tears to my eyes. This is my country. I am so lucky that my family and I were fortunate enough to have, have escaped Nazi Germany when we did. So many others did not, and their only crime was being Jewish. But let us not be naive. Hate bigotry, and anti-Semitism still exist. Let your voices be heard when you hear something that bothers you. 2020, it was a tumultuous year. A horrible COVID virus epidemic, shooting and riots in some of our streets, and an unusually contested presidential election. But this week, a, virus, a vaccine was started for the virus, and democracy prevailed in our election process. And as Hillary Clinton said in her concession speech in 2016, the American dream is big enough for everyone. Oh, my grandmother, she was, she was in Nuremberg, yes. Yeah, the other grandparents were the ones in Italy. Uh, luckily, I don't know of anyone. I know um, two cousins were sent to England on the, um, that ch children's transport, and their parents came here and they later followed and, um, you know, they, they moved to New Jersey, so we did see quite a bit of them afterwards, but they spent the war in England. And one distant cousin was taken in by nuns in Belgium, and he later became a priest. And I, I never quite got, you know, knew what happened to him. But um, my, my parents did have close friends who were in concentration camps. And I remember growing up and one couple in particular, I mean, she had numbers on her arm. I always knew that. And she had lost her husband in the concentration camp. She was sterilized. And of course, you know, at that time they didn't have in vitro. And, um, but 
She was remarkable. The best sense of humor, the nicest person you could meet. I mean, it, it's remarkable how these people survived. Well, the only thing is that, um, yeah, I have no memories other than that night of my childhood in Germany. I really don't really, what I'm talking about here are things that I was told more than things that I remember. I mean, I remember Kristallnacht, but that's it. That, that's as vivid as the day it occurred when I think about it. But um, I've just lost all my childhood early childhood memories. Uh, yes, um, I had a brother who was passed away and um, he had mental problems. This was my younger brother that I mentioned. He was six and a half years younger than I am. And um, I don't know whether his mental problems stemmed from that. My mother always felt guilty that it was her fault. Uh, we know it wasn't, but she always felt that they would have been here a year earlier if she hadn't insisted on having another child before they left. And um, she could never quite shed that feeling. So um, uh, he, he Actually, he was a schizophrenic, and he was hospitalized a good part of his life, and it was very, very sad. And, and, and that's, that just brings it, because I can see that. I can still see that on their arms, and this, this mass of men there just standing there. And my mother never liked me wearing khaki, because it reminded her of the Germans. She said, how can you wear that color? <laughs> Synagogue, my mother and my grandfather both sang in the choir. They did in Germany, they did here. As a matter of fact, they both sang in Central Synagogue when we first came here in New York, and then later in Queens when we joined another uh, conservative synagogue. But we definitely kept our Jewish roots, and um, the story my mother tells is the only time that her grandmother ever hit her is when she picked strawberries on a Saturday, <laughs> because that was not to be done. It was sacrilegious. And I, I believe one of her grandfathers was a rabbi. Um, in, well, in some ways, yes. My mother, I think, just always felt guilty because she always said, you know, do you feel deprived? And I never did. I really never did. I mean, they, they truly tried to give me, I, I just never had that feeling. I'm sure my mother did. I mean, she just totally changed her life. She moved to an apartment, had never cooked and never cleaned, and here she was doing all these things. And she would never again buy a house. My father really wanted to buy a house, and they always lived in an apartment. She was just afraid of that. And they finally did buy a condo in Florida, but, um, you know, never a house while I lived with them. And um, I did get away with a lot of things. Um, I would tell them, well, this is how it's done in America, so whatever I said, that was okay. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes, I brought uh, the doll, the doll uh, I think the doll carriage. As a matter of fact, I do remember one instant while these people were, there were constantly people running in and out of the house after that while they were packing the lifts, and that's what they used to transport uh, the goods to the United States. And my mother said, do you want to bring your dollhouse or your doll carriage? So you had to make choices. I mean, they just would not let you bring everything. And um, 
But at that time, you know, children didn't have a lot of toys as they do today. So you had one doll. And later on, I had, I, remember I had a baby doll. But, but this one always stayed with me. She, there were pictures of me everywhere with Elsabel, always with my doll in Germany and later on even here. Well, we should never forget. So many people, not many, but people are still saying that it never occurred. Well, it should never, ever happen again. I mean, there is still hate and um, so much around and persecution. And, and we've just seen it. I mean, the rioting in the streets in this country. And uh, it's starting up again in small parts here and there. You know, burning of synagogues or writing on synagogues and writing on Jewish gravestones so that we do, we do need to definitely remember and remember all those who gave their lives. Well, growing up, it was during the World War II years, of course, and um, my parents did not speak of it very often. It was just not something we discussed. And as a matter of fact, I was a little ashamed of their German accents. And I always, although they spoke fluent English, they had to take English in school. In fact, my father went to school in England, so he really spoke English very well. And, uh, but I always worked on them, my mother especially with her THs, which she couldn't quite master. <laughs> but um, they were very proud of being Americans and always celebrated the 4th of July. That was big time celebration in my house. Uh, yes, um, as a matter of fact, I have never been back to Germany. I just, even though I traveled in Europe, I couldn't bring myself to go. I had an opportunity way after the war to go with my mother who had an invitation from the mayor of Nuremberg to visit. And she somehow contrived to get an invitation for me and my husband, who was American born, to accompany her. And my husband kept saying, I don't think this is a good idea. I think this, this they're just going to do something. As it happened, my mo mother in law happened to pass away right at that time, so we never went. But um, I just could never bring myself to go back. My mother did go back because of reparations. Um, of course, the house was taken from us. My father's factory was taken. And they did get some reparations, some monies back from the German government. Uh, I have not, and I'm sorry that I haven't. I missed the opportunity a couple of years ago when I should have gone. And I don't know if I'll get there anymore, and I wish I had. <laughs> I mean, I, I did go to Egypt, and I should have gone to Israel at that time. <laughs> My uncle, uh, an aunt, my aunt, my uncle's wife, uh, was born in Austria, and they lived in Austria before the war. And uh, he was a professional singer, later became a cantor. And they did, surprisingly, go back to Austria after he retired. But my parents visited several times, and my mother always said she did not feel comfortable there. And although they invited me to come, I, Never did. <laughs> I, 
Um, obviously not, because they threw me right into school and I adapted. <laughs> well, my parents had visited here the uh, year before we immigrated. <coughs> and uh, they had been to Chicago. My father had been to Chicago on business several times. So um, they, there were things I'm sure that they found difficult, but um, I never felt that they had a problem. They kept in touch with many, many of their friends from Germany, I mean, all over the country, I mean, all their lives, whether they were in New York or California or Florida or wherever they lived. It was a group that always stayed close and stayed in touch. A couple of years ago, um, I noticed an article in my husband's law journal, and it was written by a person called Peter Nye, and the name rang a bell, I thought. Uh, there was a Peter Nye in my photo album that I grew up with, and it mentioned in that article that he had grown up in Germany and he was looking for people who knew his parents. So I contacted him, sure enough, it was the same person. And we connected and we knew a lot of the same people after all those years. And evidently he was in my pre-kindergarten class. So that was quite interesting. Yeah. Well, that, that was what was so interesting, that, you know, his, his parents, of course, you know, knew my parents, and we threw out names of people, you know, our parents' friends that we both mutually knew. And uh, that was quite an experience. A little bit, to my childhood, yes, mm -hmm. exactly, exactly. I mean, I, I didn't remember, I mean, my mother was very good at keeping picture albums, photo albums, and writing names in them, so I have records of all that. And before she passed, we made her write a journal, so we do have a lot of her memories, which are great. <laughs> Uh, not when I was growing up, only in the later years when I started questioning. I think while I was growing up, again, things were still going on. It was during the war. They really did not talk about it. They wanted me to have a normal childhood. And they were very insistent on that. I mean, we had a very wonderful, happy household. I would say maybe high school, definitely college and beyond. But yeah, it's like, yeah, I have to, I brought these, I mean, th these are the clothes. Yeah, I, I was going to change her clothes, but her arm is coming off. I was afraid to get her undressed. But look at this. I mean, she actually, this is that little Tyrolean sweater. <laughs> these are replicas of my clothes. Okay. <laughs> that, um, that just what I had, I, there was a trunk full. There was a trunk full of stuff. Look at the firm muff <laughs> and this little, coat. <laughs> I mean, somebody made these. I think my mother's dressmaker probably made the replicas of all this stuff. But that's, that's all that's left, and some of it got moth-eaten, I'm sure. I wanted to know why. I kept saying, why? Why didn't you see this coming? You know, how was it? And the answer was, we were good Germans, you know. Why would they touch us? Why would they do this? So again, we have to remember this today. You know, we are good Americans. Let's be aware of the atrocities that are going on in our country. You know, use your, use your voices. Use your voices and be heard. When you hear something that bothers you and that you feel is wrong, say something, do something. <laughs> keep our democracy going.
Thank you, Mrs. Kaplan, for sharing your experience during the November pogrom with us today. Many people during the pogrom acted as bystanders or onlookers or witnesses, but failed to act to protect their neighbors. This failure to act could have stemmed from several reasons, fear for their own safety, agreement with Nazis, or simple indifference. The lesson we can learn from Mrs. Kaplan's testimony is that indifference is dangerous. In the words of Holocaust survivor and Nobel laureate Elie Wiesel, the opposite of love is not hate, it's indifference. Even today, human rights violations are taking place throughout the world and in our own country. Never again, a phrase you may have heard in reference to the Holocaust, was to represent that another atrocity, such as the murder of six million Jews and millions of others, was to be stopped and never allowed to happen again. But never again has happened again and again. It is our hope that with the lessons you've learned this week, you will be inspired to keep learning, to make your voices heard, to be an upstander, and not to remain indifferent for, to the suffering of others. For more information about resources to continue learning about the Holocaust, as well as other genocides that have taken place since then, please visit our website at hmmsa.org.